Hi, this is Richard from Animate.com and in this fourth video on Blender's Shader Node Editor and Texture Coordinates, we're trying to distort texture coordinates. This way we can produce some dynamical effects like fluid motion of waves or distorted fire and flames. And in order to do so, we will have to drive the distortion with one texture to distort the texture coordinates of another texture. So our node setup will be slightly more complicated than in the previous videos, but I assure you we will use less math than in the previous videos. So let's jump right into it. There are many reasons to distort texture coordinates. Since the given textures are all quite basic functions, you can combine them to distort each other to produce much more individual structures. For example, the Voronoi texture is wonderful to get cellular patterns, but they look very irregular. The cell's gradients are perfect circles, their edges are straight lines. Distort the Voronoi texture to get fringed borders and squeeze the cells. In opposite, you want to use the Voronoi cells to map one texture into each cell. For example, flowers that are scattered irregular like the cells. And of course, we can do dynamical shader animations like fire, beat flat, or volumetric. So let's start to distort some textures. First, we would like to distort the Voronoi map. We will need to add a texture, Voronoi texture. And right here we see that these look very, very regular. Like I said before, there are straight edges between the cells and the cells have a perfect circular gradient. In order to get some irregularities into that, we need to add a texture coordinate and distort it by use of another map. In our case, we will use a noise texture for that. Usually we would directly plug in the object coordinates, for example, into the Voronoi texture. But in order to distort these coordinates, we need to add something that is mixing our uh, noise texture output with the object coordinates. And we can do that either with a mix RGB color node or with the converter vector math node. I would recommend to set the type to multiply add so we have a base on which we want to add another vector at a certain factor. That could be the factor 0.5 for example. And as we plug in the vector into the Verona texture we already see a very irregular shape of the cells. If we change the settings of the noise, which distorts the vector coordinates, then we see how the details in the cells and their distortion is changing also. In order to use the MixRGB node, uh, it's fine if we just set a low factor and connect it to the Voronoi texture as well. You see you can change the factor in order to increase the distortion of this effect. So now we want to distort some vector coordinates in order to map an image texture into each cell of a Voronoi texture. For this we are going to add both an image texture and the Voronoi texture. Of course we are going to need texture coordinates and we are going to add a vector math node because we will have to subtract coordinates. First of all, we are going to select an image which we want to get into the cells and we can plug it into the base color of our shader. Then we are going to use some sort of coordinates. I choose object coordinates and right now I see I have to change the projection from flat to box so that each side of the cube is mapped correctly. But in order to get the flowers into each cell, I will set the vector math node to subtract, use the object coordinates, and I also use the same object coordinates 
for mapping the Voronoi texture. That's very crucial. Because now we can subtract the position of each cell. This is the center location of each cell, which is outputted here. And if we subtract it from the object coordinates, then we will end up with the image being projected into each cell. But in order to see that, we have to adjust the size and the offset of the image. And we do so by choosing the vector mapping node. If we slightly offset, you can see that uh, there is about the same structure in each cell. And that's just a very tiny part of our flower image. We have to scale it down by setting the scale uh, to a higher value. It's a good indicator to use about the same number as the scale of the Voronoi cells. And one last thing, we don't want to see tiled flowers. We want one image per cell. So I'm going to switch off the repeat and set it to clip. And then there is just one flower in each cell visible. Additionally, we could use some random rotation. In order to do so, we can utilize the mapping node, which we already have, and we choose a combine XY set node. Plug in the color into the set to get some variation in that component, and that's the rotation. Maybe the set component doesn't have enough variation, so we can increase the amplitude of this variation by multiplying the color output. I increase that and we see that the flowers rotate. If we take a closer look on the mapping itself, we see that each cell has about the same colors. They go from uh, red to green and have some yellow and orange parts, which is about the middle of our texture. Of course, uh, the purely red part and the black part, that's one border of our image, and the purely green and uh, bright parts are the other sides of our texture. And we see that each cell has about the same coloring. This is why we see about the same areas of our image texture mapped into them. And finally, we're going to add some flames and animate them by distorting the coordinates. And if the distorting texture is moving, then it will look like the distortion itself is changing in a very dynamical way. In order to do so, we add a shader and we will use a noise texture for the distortion. We are going to use texture coordinates and we're going to separate the set component of our object coordinates. If we plug it into the base color, we see that we have a gradient that goes in vertical direction, and we drive a color ramp with that in order to color our flames. Let's also add some emission with these colors so that the fire actually glows just like that. If we want to have more variation, we can also plug the color into the strength and that will have a more natural look as the red parts of the flame will glow less than the white parts down here. Great, but this looks very regular. First off, I would like to map the set coordinate so that the color ramp covers another range and I'm choosing map range for that. I want the set component, the set coordinate, to get into a factor from 0 to 1, but I would like to start at the set height of minus 1 to do so. So our gradient goes from bottom to top along the cube. And in order to have some tolerance at the heights, I will reduce the full height of that. And now we are ready to distort our coordinates. I think the easiest way would be to just plug in the math node right in here and set its type to multiply add 
this way we can add a factor to our base value. We're going to use uh, the output of the noise texture and we already see a distorted flame and by changing the multiplier factor we can increase the distortion itself. So this way we see uh, we're sliding down into an area where we can't see anything so maybe I should change the values of the map range here to adjust the distortion back to where we need it. About this. But how do we animate that? Well, I told you earlier that by offsetting the distorting texture, which is the noise texture in our case, if we move it up now, then we should see the flames as if they were burning. And we can do so by using a mapping node again. I will insert it here between some object coordinates and the noise texture. It slightly changed the size and scale of the noise texture. I will reduce it again. Maybe I will introduce some distortion in order to make it more fiery. If I now change the set value in the location of our mapping node. Then we see the flames burning. And how do we animate that value? Well, we start with a value of zero. I press the key I on my keyboard. Then I press the spacebar. I see how the frames are changing. I have about two to three seconds now. Uh, and stop it again by the spacebar and I change the value, how far should the flames go within two or three seconds. About that, and again I press I to generate a keyframe here. But this only generates a short section of animation, just the two seconds. So the flames are moving just in this area, and we see that they're easing, they're stopping down as they approach the second keyframe, as they slowly start um, at the beginning after the first keyframe. So we're selecting both keyframes by pressing A. I press the key T in order to set the interpolation to linear. That will vanish the easing out of the keyframes. And finally I hit Shift E in order to set the extrapolation. This is how the animation behaves after the keyframes took place. Well, it extrapolates linearly now, which means it just repeats the motion. And we can see our flames moving and moving and moving endlessly. But that's not it. I promised you to have a look at volumetric distortions. And let's just keep this sample. I will duplicate our fire and make a volumetric shader out of it. First of all, I will individualize this material by hitting the small number 2, as we have twice used this material now. Now it's just a volumetric fire for this cube alone. We won't need the surface shader on this material, so I can just delete it. Instead, we are using a shader, principled volume shader. And again, we can plug in the color ramp into the color as well as the density because we will use this gradient and its lightness or the value of the colors as density and of course again we want to have emission it shall glow and light our scene by itself let's give it an emission strength of one as we're beginning and ending with black color so there won't be light emission above and below our flames. If we connect the volume uh, output with the volume input of our material output, we see that there are flames appearing in the box. If we're using EV, then of course we have to set the right distance in the volume settings of our renderer. You see there are start and end distances. Uh, be as close to your volumetric object as possible in order to have a good shading. If these limits are too far away from our volumetric shading, then it will scatter. So let's just try to increase that value and 
decrease that one. So you see that we have just about three slices in this volume, which doesn't look good. So again, we go from 2.4 to 10 meters distance to the camera, which makes much denser ray marching of our, uh, of our volume. Of course, also this fire is animated. Blender will need some time to construct the volumetric ray marching of this volume shade. Here. So it might be better if you just go to the next frames using the right arrow to actually see the progress of our volume rather than hitting play because then we just will have a blurred image of our animation. If we don't want to have such a, a cubic volume, we can restrict the density of our volume with additional shapes. I often use a gradient texture for that. Uh, let's use the object coordinates, set the gradient texture to spherical and multiply that into our color output of course, to keep the color, we probably sh should just use the density and maybe the emission strength and just alter these with the spherical gradient we just produced. I'm using a converter math node for that. And uh, in order for you to see that precisely, I'm connecting this node with the factor. Yeah, I want to multiply the math node and it's like I just squeezed it in between here. You see? And we can see a volumetric sphere of fire going up here. If that's uh, not dense enough and not bright enough, and of course we can add a second multiply node and increase the factor at which the density and the emission shall take place. Yeah, they cover the background quite well now. And even lowering the red part looks good so far. Of course, we haven't seen very sophisticated uh, samples for distorting and working with a vector coordinate, but I will promise you in the upcoming uh, videos, we will do some parallax mapping and projection mapping, which will be mathematically quite complicated. So I wanted to assure that the basics are explained very well in these first videos and we are prepared to understand uh, the more complicated stuff. A comment in the comment section. Have a look at my other products on Blender Market. Subscribe to the channel to get notified or when new uploads are happening. So I hope you learned a lot about shader nodes and how to distort texture coordinates. We will use that in the next video where we will produce a parallax occlusion mapping technique. That's a way to fake depth into a surface without adding any geometry, but rather distort texture coordinates, depending on the point of view. Happy blending! Bye!